listening to a 4x4 Radio Network podcast. Thanks for listening to the podcast. Before we get underway, I have a couple of audio show notes. To help increase our listenership and broaden how you can listen to the show, we have joined the 4x4 Radio Network, and the show is now available on Stitcher. Please visit 4x4radionetwork.com and stitcher.com. If you like the show, please rate and review us on iTunes or Stitcher. We'll also read your tweets. Sorry for the delay in posting this show. Recently, I had an audio engineer review my setup, and he determined that there was a bad cable in the connections. So we've replaced that $4 cable, and I think it's improved the audio quality considerably. He also suggested using a better audio production application. So I've switched to Audacity, which has resulted in me changing my entire process and learning how to use Audacity, which is nearly the opposite of GarageBand. I think we're past the learning curve, and the next show shouldn't take as long to post. Final note, we recorded the show one week ago. At that time, the results of the Defender seizure arbitration case were not known. All the seized trucks are being returned to their owners. A link to that story will be in the show notes. Will Hendrick was instrumental in securing this positive result. Will is a Land Rover enthusiast, and he quit his job and worked pro bono to help the owners of the seized Defenders. A GoFundMe site has been started to help him out, so why don't you consider donating? A link to the GoFundMe site will also be in the show notes. Thanks again for listening. We enjoy hearing from you, seeing your trucks, and reading your tweets and Facebook posts. To bar from my favorite podcast, let's start the show. The Center Steer Podcast, a Land Rover podcast by Land Rover owners. Welcome to the Center Steer Podcast. This is show number 26 for May 31st, 2015. If you're outside the United States, that's 31 May, 2015. Uh, is that metric dating? Is that how that goes? <laughs> it's R-O-W. Rest of world. Rest of world. Uh, this month, uh, May, we are proudly joining the 4x4 Radio Network. Uh, the 4x4 Radio Network is one place to go to listen to all of your 4x4 needs. Uh, there's a uh, discussion of Jeeps uh, with the XJ Talk. Uh, Tony does a wonderful job with his podcast. Uh, there's also our friend uh, Dan with the 4x4 podcast itself. And uh, then there's also the Muddy Microphone podcast. That's a new addition to the 4x4 radio network. Not to mention the fact that we're out there. So the Center Steer podcast is now part of that network. It's one place to go, as I said, to listen to not only our show, but their shows. You can listen to them right on the website. And if the website is 4x4radionetwork.com. That's 4x4, the number 4, x4, number 4. I screwed that up, but you'll check it out. There's a link on our website to it, obviously. Uh, but go ahead, check it out, and we can listen to the other, other shows. We certainly would appreciate that. So this month, uh, joining me in the studio is uh, Harold. Hello. And you'll have an M word later. Perhaps. Uh, <laughs> with us via Skype uh, as from the great state of Vermont is uh, Morgan. Hello. And how's Morgan doing? How's your any update on your uh, on your series uh, rebuild? Uh, let's see the uh, the steering column and uh, steering box that were completely seized are out. So that's uh, a little bit of progress. Excellent. <laughs> I haven't. I don't think we've seen any pictures or. You're going to rebuild those or replace them? Uh, I'm going to rebuild the steering box. The actual steering column is actually in pretty good case, uh, uh, pretty good condition. So, okay. And joining us from across the pond, the Atlantic Ocean, is Matt with Land Rovers Live. Hello. Welcome. It's it's great to have you. We certainly enjoy you uh, participating and joining us on the panel, Matt. No problem. Thank you. Great to be here. How how comes uh, Land Rovers Live? Uh, in, uh, how, uh, what, I forget what the broadcast version is called. LRL Adventure, is that right? Well, that's absolutely right. We've uh, Well, we finished Series 1, uh, and obviously that brings us to, I don't know, maybe show 15, 20, something like that on the, the web version. But what we've now done is consolidated the whole thing. We figured we've not got in trouble for a long time, so we're going to revert back to... Land Rover's Live across all platforms now. Uh, and Series 2 will be upon us very shortly. Uh, the plan, then, is to never stop for another season break, just to carry on straight through. So uh, we're making a bit more work for ourselves, but it's all good. Well, you could take a small break uh, in the middle of Series 2 and then return with Series 2A. <laughs> <laughs> Touche. Well played, well played. Yeah, that was very well, good. Well, 
As it happens, that is exactly what we'll be doing because uh, in terms of production, because this time, well, the next time I speak on Centre Steer, I should be uh, a dad again. So um, on that basis, I will be taking a couple of weeks, but uh, hopefully we'll have filled that gap. So that would be Matt Cooper Series 2 or Series yep. or series 3? It's, it's 2A. 2A. <laughs> <laughs> so where can, uh, where can our non-UK listeners uh, find all of your content? So for anybody not in the UK, then the best place to catch our stuff would be uh, in passing on YouTube, which uh, search Land Rover's Live or Land Rover Defender or more or less anything Land Rover related and we'll be, we'll be up there. You have your uh, own channel, right? We have our own channel, and our actual home online is nexi, N-E-X-I, dot TV, forward slash Land Rovers Live. And we keep that up to date with not just the shows, but competitions, text blogs, and uh, links to this place. Wonderful. Well, first up, we're going to talk about the news. We haven't reported on sales in quite a while, but uh, some interesting sales information, I think, of JLR to mention. Apparently, despite our not talking about it, they've still been selling. They have, especially in the United States. Glad you asked. <laughs> in the United States, sales are up. Uh, Land Rover was up 17% for uh, April, and uh, April 20, 2015, uh, driven by the Range Rover and Range Rover Avoc. So sales have have gone up and are doing pretty well. Jaguar, as a side note, uh, is up 4%, driven by sales of the F-Type and the XF. Uh, kind of interestingly, uh, on the other side of the coin, though, Jag Land Rover's profits have declined for the past two years in China. Considered to be the largest uh, auto market in the world, uh, sales have been dropping, and uh, profits, because that's how this uh, article uh, from Auto News uh, indicated, is that profits fell 33% uh, in the three months ending in March for JLR in China. Uh, some interesting little things to to mention is that uh, you know uh, Land Rover is finally starting to sell um, their, their uh, a car, the, the Avoc, which is being produced in China, so they have a plant in China, and they started to sell that in February, and um, but yet sales have started to slow. BMW has even uh, reduced their sales figures, and I think uh, reducing production in China because of uh, decreased sales. Apparently, the this article indicated that uh, there's been a little pressure from the Chinese government to reduce luxury spend and luxury items, so that might be part of the reason uh, for the decrease in sales. Um, well, you can only support explosive growth for so long before the, the economy corrects, if you will, to use the term. Uh, some call it a bubble, but uh, nonetheless, normally the luxury items are the first things to suffer when you have a correction like that. Yeah, apparently... Well, there's a, been a, a big push to reduce prices. Uh, also, there's a big uh, the market has been, been a, a big pressure to reduce prices in, in China. And but uh, I guess uh, CEO of Jag Land Rover has said you know they're going to be aggressive. Surprise on keeping being competitive. Yeah, and Land Rover have tried to be aggressive by f- chasing out the uh, the guys who produce the Landwind X7, which not sure if you've seen that but it uh if you haven't just take a look at it and evoke and it looks just like that but they recently took uh the manufacturers of those guys to court and rather interestingly uh something that would never have happened in the u.s or or in europe they lost in court uh with they were bringing a case i believe which was uh along the lines of stolen ideas and, and ip uh saying that the the landwind x7 May bear some resemblance to the Evoke, which, uh, which if you do a quick Google search, you can make your own minds up on that. But, uh, that vehicle comes out at about a third of the price of the Evoke, and for my money, looks exactly the same. If one went past you at 50, 60 mile an hour, I, uh, I don't think you'd tell the difference. That can't help these things. Well, historically, it's difficult to to win a, a case of infringement or, or theft of idea from in, in the Asian theater. Yeah, it's just not how the their culture works, really. Apparently, you can't own an idea over there. Not the government own it. Yes. Well, and, and actually, if you're doing any business in China, the government has to own 51% of whatever it is you're doing there. So they're always the majority uh, partner of any operation. Mm. So, so therefore, everything is pretty much theirs. That. We're in danger of upsetting some uh, internationals at this stage. Uh, yes, yeah. I mean, it's just well, it's just the way it is, though. I mean, that's yeah. 
And that's not so, exclusive. That's not exclusive to the car car field either. No, it's it's yeah. it's just business, and that's how the business is done yes, over there. And that's not right. Exactly, it's how business is done. So yeah, I'm not trying to say it's good, bad, or otherwise. That's just how it is. Yeah, right. And that's what you contend with. But I I would agree with Matt though that uh, that X Wind, whatever name it it is, does look an awful lot like the Avoc. Uh, you know, of course, I wonder about build quality. You know, of course, you also wonder about build quality of the Evoque that's being built in China too. <laughs> Is it going to be the same? You know, then comparatively speaking. Yeah, the know. big problem in China is not so much the quality it, the potential; it's the consistency of quality. Is one example exactly as good as the next? And that's that's been uh, historically a big problem for the Chinese. They're capable of building really good stuff, but they're also oh, capable yeah. of building some crap. So it's it's Absolutely. and sometimes it's it's a bit of a, a, a dice roll as far as which you're going to get. Right, right. I think it probably has to do with the manufacturer that is uh, partnering with them that's being built. For example, you know, like I've got a lot of Apple equipment. Those are all built in China. They're very fine, well built products. But you wonder if you have the knockoff version uh, or uh, you know an off brand, if you will, you know, then the quality may suffer. Mm. The, the, the same could be said for Solihull at times throughout the years, though. <laughs> <laughs> hey, don't bring that up. <laughs> well, they, they used to say that about buying a car built in, in over here in, in the States, too. If you, you didn't want to buy one built on a Monday or a Friday, for instance. <laughs> yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And it, thanks to the Japanese, they you know knocked everybody around, and, and we got we have better built cars now, just in general mm-hmm. for everybody. It only, <laughs> only took the Americans, what, 30 years to kind of catch up with uh, good build quality and well, yeah, I have some things to say about that, but maybe we won't take our time now. No, no, we don't have to. But uh, I mean, generally, it seems that the um, while the Americans have, have gotten generally better over the years, I think the Europeans have kind of stagnated a little bit. That's the just things that I hear and have seen. Whereas the you know the Asian Japanese in particular have gotten keep that quality high. Well, it, to a certain extent, they've lost some ground over the past decade or so. Toyota's been having some, some significant oh. quality problems and, sure. and things that would have been unheard of 20 years ago to think, you know, because at that time they were just so far ahead of everyone on quality. And, and maybe it's not so much that they've lost ground, but that everyone else has caught up to them. Well, everyone's caught up, but also vehicles have become so much more immensely complex since then. Really? <laughs> just a little bit. Mm. Uh, uh, and that, that's a big deal you know in Europe quality and various other things have suffered but if you take a look at Europe as a market the, the pressures on car manufacturers to to uh, to abide by the latest Euro NCAP and Euro safety and Euro emission rules really squeezes um, development and, and such and they you know they have to spend so much money on making vehicles compliance uh, these days and every year there's a new version of that coming out you take the the new uh, ingenium engine and the stuff that they have to put in there now they're all you know many cars are running on adblue these days uh from europe just to comply with the emissions which uh you know has to take a huge amount of the the development budget out of doing some of the the other things that we'd like to see cars doing for those yeah. of you that don't get diesel engines adblue is a, is the diesel exhaust fluid additive Mm. Which is an and emissions that's control. Urea based, right? Yeah, it's urea based. Yes, it's that's it's, right. Yeah, it's to regenerate the particulate filter. If you really want to know the techs on it, is that is that why my jetta smells of uh, of urine when I when in certain directions? That's your own problem because <laughs> uh, the jetta is one of the few uh, engine designs that does not require an exhaust fluid. Mm-hmm. They regenerate the particulate filter using uh, excess diesel. They actually burn a little extra fuel late in the cycle. And superheat the the uh, particulate filter and burn it out that way. Hmm. Interesting. Very cool. Uh, however, uh, I, I I do agree with Matt on you know it it does make it difficult for automakers, but also I think it's an opportunity for automakers because you've seen the United States cars suffered for a long time I think and they focused on certain things and they didn't focus on design uh, they focused on design and they focused on features and they didn't necessarily focus on the build quality but I think w- it, when uh, they got hit with um, uh, competitors and they had that pressure to get better reliability that was one factor on them but I think the the you know the government then also came in and made them have better fuel mileage uh, requirements and that also challenged them and it was given them an opportunity to make a different kind of car a better car and also you know put money towards those things that allowed them to make 
you know, uh, generally a better car. And, and to, you know. to draw a parallel to what Matt's saying, that we were in that position that, that, that Europe is now in, that we had these this onslaught of new regulations related to safety and emissions that, that we've kind of already gone through and, and had mm-hmm. to come to terms with, and that made it really difficult for our manufacturers for quite a while and, and really added a complexity that we weren't quite ready for, let's say. And, and but who's, ready, who's ever ready for that? The Americans weren't ready for, to, for the, the competition from uh, increased reliability and build quality. You know, that's well, anytime you, you, sorry, you I don't, up the requirement, you, you, there is an adjustment process. I'm not saying it's, 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 I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I'm not yeah. trying to explain anything away by saying that. It's just the fact is that we weren't ready for it. And so there's, of course, because we're never ready for change, and, and there's an you adjustment are. process right. to, to, to that and to – you, know, you 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 meet the the standard, but then you have to back that up with the reliability, which sometimes comes after that. Right, right. Well, it has interesting effects on the market as well. Uh, in the U.S., a lot of that allowed uh, we had you know slightly weaker standards in terms of efficiency and safety and and weight um, on trucks and SUVs. So our market really switched to SUVs for quite a while there. Which that obviously was a way for of us, getting around the regulations, yeah. Right, exactly. Obviously, that's a benefit to us driving Land Rovers, but uh, you know, it it had un- probably unforeseen side effects there. Well, yeah, everything has unforeseen side effects. I mean, that's that just kind of goes with, with without saying. And yeah, you, know, you had yeah, you, know, you had Cadillac trying a. Uh, Two, four, six, eight cylinder engine that had the you know the shut down the cylinders. And the V eight six four. You know, I mean, clever they, concept, but yeah. absolutely abhorrent in ex- execution. Yeah. Right, right. Along those lines, uh, JLR, uh, it already mentioned that they're considering a Mexican plant, didn't I? We had mentioned last time that they were considering a U.S. plant, um, it, but it sounds like that has changed slightly. Well, I, mean, I, I guess all of this is speculative any, anyway. Yeah, it's speculative. This is, uh, but they, I guess they, yeah, they were thinking about uh, southern Amer- the United States, and then now they're possibly considering Mexico building a plant there and. Having you know, locally sourced, uh, closer sourced to us, but uh, that goes back to if I, I'd like the reason I mentioned this one. That goes back to though to I think to the sales. You've got strong American sales, and building a, a view, uh, uh, you know, having a plant here in the United States or close to the United States, I think would help them out uh, to meet some of the demand and then possibly increase demand, especially for I think because this I think the disco sport's going to be sell like hotcakes. Well, it's, I think it's cheaper to build them close to where you're going to be selling them, and then you're not shipping. Right. Theoretically, yeah. shipping is cheaper. Right. Well, yeah, you shipping ship shipping boxes of part of individual parts is far more efficient than shipping full vehicles that have a lot of empty space in them. Right. Right. And if you can use locally sourced metal, then you're not even shipping that. Yes. Because that's coming from local, and that's a lot of lot of the the material involved. So it becomes less to have to ship at all. So next up uh, in the news is the Land Rover Discovery Sport, the replacement for the Freelander. I miss the Freelander. Um, but uh, it's now available in the United States. You can purchase one. Apparently, it started in May, which was surprisingly, I thought, a quiet rollout here in the U.S. I didn't recall seeing yeah, much about Not that. much fanfare involved in that. I was, yeah, I was kind of surprised. But it, uh, the New York Times did a uh, video review of the uh, Disco Sport. We'll have a link on our web, our, uh, you know, in the show notes on our website. Um, it's a four minute and 34 second review, but you should check it out. It's kind of show the car. You know, you've seen it before, but it's interesting. I thought they, did, they generally liked it. But some specific news regarding the Disco Sport is that the plans have been shelved for a two-wheel drive version, at least in the U.K., because uh, the four-wheel drive emissions are sufficient that they do not need, they think, to have a two-wheel drive version. But, again, that's possibly only for the U.K. They didn't talk about the rest of the world. Yeah, I, I didn't um, – I was amazed that uh, you, you can't buy a Discovery Sport in a, in a petrol version in, in Europe. That's uh, – that was news to me. Yeah. Uh, well, and now, now you're you can, but you're only going to get it in four wheel now, at least in the UK. Yeah, but we still won't get a petrol version though. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Because you have the new Ingenium engine is now available in the Disco Sport, and that's uh, being put in there, and it's possibly going to come to the United States, but we're, that's not been confirmed yet. Uh, but the Ingenium engine is now available, and. Uh, we shall keep our collective fingers crossed. Yes. Huh. 
Uh, it'll be offered in Disco Sport in some markets. Uh, that's at least according to the article I'm reading, and uh, I don't think the United States is not considered one of those markets. However, I think generally the United States is not referred to as some markets. <laughs> I think if they were bringing it here, you'd know it. Yeah. Well, well, if you think they were going to start selling the disco sport here, we would have known it. Well, but if they're writing a story about where where it's going to be sold, if it was going to be in the U.S., they would say in yeah. the U.S. It's a big enough market. Right. Well, it still might be just passing, you know, uh, safety and emissions checks. And well, absolutely. Processes, so. it's, it's expensive to certify an engine for this market. And, and as I understand it, they are going through that process. So I, I think that they're not going to invest in that if they're not planning to actually bring it here. So apparently this Ingenium engine uh, will get, I guess there's two different versions of it, and the more powerful the two, the Disco Sport will be available, a, able to reach 62 miles per hour in 8.9 seconds and top out at 170 miles per hour, with the most economical version is uh, claimed to return 57.57 7 miles per gallon, uh, and that's in European uh, cycle. That's the European MPG cycle. I don't know what that converts to the U.S., it's probably what less. Well, you know, the thing about it is that mileage numbers depend on the test cycle that's run. And, and in fact, you know, that's sort of the problem with the number you see on the sticker of the cars you buy in the dealership here is they follow a, a test routine that's specified by the EPA. And, and those just, in my opinion, aren't all that accurate. It's, it's difficult to replicate what's going to be happening in, in real world. And that's why they always say your mileage may vary. So I don't really know how to convert the European test cycle to, to the, even to the EPA cycle and, and get it in numbers we might understand. Speaking of uh, diesel engines, the Range Rover Sport will here in the United States will have a diesel option that has been confirmed, and it will cost an additional $1,500 over the petrol. Which actually isn't bad when you when you look at uh, you look at trucks uh, full size trucks which are typically you know all you can get with a diesel outside of a few shining examples, and that's Jetta. yeah for instance, uh, but in the in the full size trucks if you want the diesel you're paying about four thousand dollars extra so fifteen hundred is not bad, shouldn't take too long to recoup the savings in in fuel cost I would think. Yeah, the uh, 2016 Range Rover Sport SE TD6 will retail for $66,450 plus a one, $995 destination fee. Yes, yeah, so if you can afford that much, you can afford the, the extra 1000 and a half for the engine, that's for sure. And that is uh, an additional 1500 more than the gasoline-fueled Sport SE with a 3-liter supercharged V6, which is uh, retails for 64950 U.S. Are they not doing the Range Rover Sport with the V8 anymore? I do not know that. It's a good question. I don't know. I don't have that information. Interesting. Yes. Yes. I. I don't know. Well, maybe the Sport. Maybe it's a Sport. Maybe the maybe the regular the full Rangey may get the. V8. Yeah, the Rangey Sport with the V8 was something else. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> Especially with the with the supercharged V8. Right. Right. So how, how were petrol uh, engines received over in the UK, uh, Matt? Um, well, you don't see many around, and you laugh a little bit when you do. The, uh, the you know the cost of gas over here is uh, is fairly prohibitive to actually owning a, a petrol one. But uh, you know, occasionally you, you see them around, and the uh, you know, but generally, if you see a petrol one, it won't look as it did when it came out the factory. It'll have all sorts of spruced up bits bolted to it that's uh that would be the nature of the if i was making a sweeping generalization of of a petrol owner over here it would be uh that they'd attach bigger wheels and all sorts of bits of shiny stuff to it as well is a gasoline engine available from the dealer uh, in the uk and the range rover sport yes on the standard range rover i don't quote me, but I don't think it is, and certainly not across the rest of the Land Rover line. Do you see many uh, many of the uh, petrol engines being converted to propane? Uh, not on newer vehicles. You, 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 you see a lot of Discovery 2s, a lot of V8 Defenders, um, but I, I think that there's, there's about 10-15% loss of power when you when you convert to uh, to LPG, at least. so um, I think at that stage, people are sort of looking back to to diesels at that stage. But there are, you know, c- certainly V8 
Defenders and Discovery 1 and 2. Uh, they're popular for, for RPG conversion, but uh, I I wouldn't think you'd see anything like that. No, I, certainly nothing's come across my radar. So people aren't buying them new with with the petrol engine and then converting to propane to recoup the, the fuel savings? It's so You don't see those products advertised, and I don't see them fitted to... To vehicles, uh, I, I think a big part of it uh, as well is you know you're actually sacrificing quite a bit of your vehicle, and you don't mind doing that in an older vehicle. But um, I think it's kind of had its heyday, you know. For you know, there's been a few trends of fuel over here. One of them was you know in the mid 90s was to put LPG conversions into things, and then after that there was a there was a tax allowance that meant you could recycle your own vegetable oil and use that tax-free in a diesel engine. So that sort of swung the other way, which meant that people were doing that. You can make 2,000 litres a year of, of biodiesel, mm-hmm. uh, and now they've, they've put the kibosh on all of it. But um, but I think there's been various trends, and an LPG is not that widely available uh, and not all that popular now, I wouldn't have thought. Interesting. I've, I've heard of, I've heard a lot of chatter on various forums about people doing it. So I was curious how much you'd actually seen it. Uh, it was big here in the in the 70s and and into the 80s. In fact, even as late as the 90s, it was being played with. And and uh, I actually did some research in in uh, LPG fueling of, of small engines and, and fuel injection, and actually have a patent in that uh, going back in the day. But that's been a been a while. Yeah, I, I mean, it's certainly a a benefit. Uh, I think there was there was an issue, and I don't know exactly why it was, but I, I recall coming across my radar at the time that V8 discoveries were catching fire, and a lot of them were going up in smoke with with LPG conversions on them. That something um, mm. about the conversions that were available yeah. was you, uh, was yeah. causing the whole thing. If you don't do it right, and you get some loose gas under the hood with with dodgy electrics, you, you have sort of a bomb on wheels. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's. I mean, you know, I don't really understand the the technology all that much, but I know that uh, that was a, a thing to look out for on a on an LPG discovery. That they were they they had a tendency to uh, to explode a little. Interesting. I did a little research while you guys were talking, and the uh, V8 is still available on the supercharged Range Rover here in the United States for a mere eighty thousand dollars American. Bargain. So, so more than the diesel. Uh, I, without doing a lot more digging and you know, trying to run the podcast at the same time, I'm not sure. But uh, the SE is 63, the HSE is 68, and the supercharged is 80, 79.9. Well, if you want a hot rod truck, that's that's what you want. But yeah, you'll pay for it. You will. You will. Pay for it once, and you'll keep paying for it at the pump. That's for sure. So, and the nice thing in, in that article uh, it, about the, the Range Rover Sport being available with a diesel here is that uh, Land Rover has indicated they still intend to uh, bring the diesel engines to even more products in the U.S. So I think that would be a good opportunity for you know, the rest of the line to get a diesel. About time. Here, here. Yes, I think we're all in support of that. For sure. Uh Moving along down the Disco line to the Disco 4, known here in the United States as the LR4, unfortunately. I still hate that designation. Uh, there is a safety uh, recall for software malfunction. Uh, I will, if you're probably already aware of it, if you have an LR4, but for those of you who don't, or if you haven't heard about it, uh, there is a glitch with the ABS software that could cause stability control, traction control, and hill descent control systems to be completely disabled. Hola, los three amigos. <laughs> if you're not familiar, there is a uh, problem with the Disco 2s, having the three amigos, uh, the three lights would light up and indicating you had basically a very similar... You have a failure in the traction control, uh, anti-lock brakes, and hill descent. Mm. So that turns into defender mode, does it? Uh, well, yeah, except you get some... You, you have no... Yeah, no uh, computer enhanced uh, functions of those things and and of course you have the pretty lights on your dash three of them hence the name yes <laughs> interesting that it's a software glitch in this case with uh, the disco 2s it was uh, normally either an abs sensor or a, a shuttle valve problem in the abs module it was both a- of which are relatively easy to fix one of them cheaply one of them not so much gotcha did, did both have to happen 
No, it was one or the other. Okay. More commonly, it was the the switch in the shuttle valve, which which uh, had a, a dodgy connection, which you could either replace the the switch assembly or you can actually. If you're adventuresome, you can cut it open and resolder it. Is that the cheap option? Yeah. Okay, that's good. But I, I think, you know, worst case, you're looking at a few hundred dollars. It wasn't a big deal. And the nice thing is you didn't have to open any hydraulics and, and bleed everything. And, 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 and then a month later, something else it, it fails, and, <laughs> and you have the problem again. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We've, I think we've, we've, so it's a very common theme. In fact, yeah. pretty much in the D2 circles, it's like, do you have the Amigos right now or do you not? Yes. First question, yeah, pretty much. Moving down or up, depending on your, your point of view, the Land Rover line, uh, there's going to be a Camel Trophy-inspired Defender coming out of the Special Vehicles Operations uh, Unit or Department or whatever they call themselves. It's going to be called the SVX. So you do know that they have, or you may not know, but if you don't, or if you do, there is three letter designations. There's the SVR, which is the uh, Road Performance Oriented Package. There's the S, uh, the SVA, which is the Autobiography. That's the Ultra, luxur- ultra Luxurious Package. And then now the this SVX is supposed to be an off-roader versioned uh, Defender coming out of the SVO group. And and yet the picture uh, in the article is it, the truck is not sand glow, despite you say it being Camel Trophy inspired. I just, yes. Yeah, well, the actual Defender SVX was around a, a few years ago, wasn't it, as a uh, as a spruced up, uh, t- tuned up TD5, uh, or it may, may have been TDCI. In fact, it was TDCI, the 60th anniversary, um, and there were a, a few of those made. I'm not uh, the these Camel Trophy defenders that have been built are, are a big, a great marketing sort of stunt from from Land Rover, and I believe there's there's a very limited amount of them being made. It would be uh, better if they brought back the actual Camel Trophy to go along with. <laughs> well, exactly, and that's when I very heard first heard this story. That was my excitement that they were going to put something together again. But uh, alas, I think it's um, that they'll effectively be show ponies, but. Uh, I don't think they'll be under the SBX name, more of just a, a product of special vehicle operations, uh, along with uh, all of the other derivatives that they're producing at the moment, and, uh, and maybe a couple more that they haven't yet announced. So you, you're indicating that you don't think the SVX will be made? Is uh, so, well, I think this, this Camel Trophy-inspired SVX, well, you have to sort of look where Land Rover are at now, and they've obviously produced the... Uh, Land Rover Adventurer Edition, which ticks all of the boxes that a, a Camel Trophy inspired SVX would, bar the colour. Uh, it's tuned up, it has all of the stuff that the old SVX had, um, and that's already announced and done. So it, it wouldn't really make sense for them to, to, to jeopardise that vehicle by just going a little bit better and calling it the SVX. And also the SVX was only ever available the previous svx was only ever available in what was essentially north american spec 90 with a roll top uh, and uh and what have you so svx as a as a designation that there will be a special vehicle with some more off-road performance sure i think land Rover will bring out uh one or two more vehicles that that are quite special whether it will be called an svx uh i'm quite sure it won't and furthermore the camel trophy uh, inspired defenders will actually be Camel Trophy replicas or very close to. So uh, I think there's a few different threads there that have all been thrown into one thing for the purposes of making an article easy to d- digest. So, because, you know, Land Rover is doing a bunch of special w- versions of the Defender as we close the Defender production. Is, is this your, sounds like what I'm hearing then, this is going to be another one of those variants because there's the, what, there's an, is there an icon? There's a, uh, there's supposed to be a landmark one, which is going to be the very end of the run. That's like I only make a you know small handful. Uh, they have leather seats, I think, and some other other things. That, uh, does this fit into that? Yes, yes, sort of. So, so at the moment, uh, well, the thing is, at the moment, every man and his dog, or any reputable Land Rover specialist, is producing a a, a special edition, and I'll I'll run through a couple of those in a second. But Land Rover themselves have released three vehicles, so they have the Heritage Edition, which is a which is a heart back to Huey, uh, comes in green, uh, and they're doing a limited run of those. Incidentally, all of these Land Rover Special Editions are sold out now, but they're doing some of those. 
then they're doing the adventure edition which is a uh, well as we just described what a long wheelbase SVX basically and then they're doing an autobiography edition which is which would be designated as an SVA which is all leather trim and a bit more spruced up and a bit more road going so those are the three available from Land Rover now it is expected that there will be at least another one you know not 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 the final editions that they've done now but a, a final final edition um, <laughs> a final details, final edition really seriously we meet it this time so details of that haven't been released yet but the icon that you're referring to is is not icon from north america but neen overland in this country produce a series of defenders called icon where they effectively have some sort of deal with jlr to receive new defenders then they bolt all sorts of extra bits and pieces to them and the icon's been going for a while and depending on what the weather's doing and what what's happening globally, Neen Overland will spec that vehicle up differently, and absolutely they will do a um, a, a, a final edition icon. Uh, the the most popular icon, if you if you're not familiar with them, is the Heritage Edition, which they've been doing for a few years now, which uh, which actually is a pretty good looking vehicle. Uh, and then, but as I said, there are quite a few people doing final edition defenders taking stock defenders and modifying them into different things so guava who who's a name that may not have come up for for many people but effectively what guava do is resell land rover into markets that they can't really get into so Myanmar, uh burma uh developing and and well developing nations so they incidentally also supply un trucks ambulances and things like that but they ha- have released, or maybe in the process of releasing, uh, a Defender called the X-Spec, which will be available in 110 only. It's been remapped, had all the bells and whistles thrown at it, and rather interestingly, only available in an automatic, which um, which is obviously not really been seen very often on a Defender. So that's quite cool. And then uh, the fairly iconic tuning house, over Finch have my sources tell me five different variants of uh, final edition defenders. There isn't very much in the way of detail on those at the moment. However, knowing Over Finch, it'll be the very high end of the market. If if you've ever seen their current Over Finch defender, which is all the the the, the rear tubs all decked out in teak and it's a beautiful shooting box and what have you in there. But of course. Yeah, I well can't. Even, the, I can't even afford to look at those, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, quite. And, and as well as that, there's been no shortage of companies wanting defenders for their brand mascots that have been creeping out the woodwork. And SVO have been working on quite a few of those. And most notably for me was one I went to visit the other week uh, for Land Rovers Live, which was a, a company called Paul Roger, which uh, they are a champagne house who made the champagne that Churchill uh, famously drank in the during the second world war and they've had commissioned a hundred and forty thousand pound defender which is a 110 soft top um and there's quite a few of these uh where big companies are are asking for a brand mascot in the way of a defender to come out of svo so i imagine there'll be some more of those dripping out as well over the next few months and And obviously uh, oh sorry Keep going. <laughs> yeah, that was it. I was going to say, that concludes my roundup of what I know about <laughs> Special Edition Defenders. Well, uh, I was also going to mention the uh, recently announced Rugby Edition that they did yes. for the, that. Absolutely right. Yeah, that, that, that was another SVO product. And I think that that's a Defender designed to ferry around the Rugby World Cup. Forgive me, I don't really know much about rugby. Um, it's going around the country taking a, a trophy in the back of it, essentially. We should, but they've got a nice little video for that online. We'll have to get uh, Graham from A to A back because he's a big rugby fan. So if he's, he'll probably be listening to this, and so a little rugby shout out. And... Indeed. Well, I think you have a. Uh, you might even have a segment now for your for your show on all these special one offs. <laughs> it yeah, seems quite. like there's so many special editions and, and one-offs that I think the most rare type of defender now is going to be the stock, the stock defender, modified <laughs> baseline defender. That's what I was thinking. Dude, this whole thing, I'm like, how many are left then? I mean, if there, you know, 
there's, you know, there's, they're probably making the last standard one right now, and then all the other, the rest of the year is going to be used for these special deals. Although, you know, this article, and we've heard this too uh, in other places, is there's been some thought that they may continue to produce the Defender, but not in the UK. It may move, they may move production to a another location, then it may continue. So there's yes. that, that rumor is out there. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure how much out there is sort of publicly available news or not, but uh, I, th- that's, that's sort of a done deal now that the Defender will carry on being reproduced. However, before everybody pops the champagne, that doesn't mean that it'll be available for, for us plebs to go and buy. That'll be really for developing nations and to fulfill existing orders, military contracts, etc., and, and really for servicing military fleets across the world. So. How about for the replacement market, replacement parts? Uh, uh, well, uh, long story short, I'm just trying to figure out how much I'm allowed to say there. Um, Ooh, Whoa, this the, is like this is like cool, cool, <laughs> cool stuff for the yeah. podcast. Yeah, um, yeah basically, uh, yeah. Yeah, for the replacement market, there will be a lot more support than there has been, uh, and I don't think that comes as any surprise. The it may have come across in the news that Land Rover are doing a lot more towards heritage vehicles now. They're they are taking heritage vehicles back into SVO to restore them in-house. Uh, they're doing a lot more uh, outwardly with with, fest- with Land Rover festivals and clubs and things. Um, and I think they're looking to really build on top of on top of that to support this heritage market and, uh, well, and what have you. And Land Rover have been criticised heavily. And you know you could say rightly so in recent years for effectively ignoring anything that's not in the current production run. And, uh, and treating old defender owners and lovers as if they were farmers and and uneducated plebs who uh, who may not fit into the, the future model of the Land Rover business. In but other words, acting like every taking. other car maker. Yeah, absolutely. Don't come to the United States because when you you uh, you, you don't even think about driving into a dealership with a series truck because they'll just they, you know, they'll walk away and. Yeah. yeah, we we drove your 110 to the dealer that one time, and the, and the, the the Land Rover technicians didn't know what it was. No. No. <laughs> yeah, and I sad. think the same thing would have happened over here as well. To be honest, it's uh, but now that you know, for many reasons, once the Defender stops, any of the heritage that Land Rover had is not displayed in their new vehicle lineup. So, in right. order to preserve that reason to purchase, which is which is you know been a big factor for Land Rover, you know, you you may buy a Freelander knowing that the same care and attention or or heritage has gone into it than that went into a defender which really performs well. Um, and that's not there in their or won't be there in their current lineup. So they're going to have to do a bit more work to support the the uh, their their heritage division. And, and I think that's that's going to start to really shine through over the next few months. And and- next year. For for any l- new listener, we did talk about Land Rover Heritage starting up uh, in our last episode. So I, if you haven't already listened yeah. to it, go back. We talked about uh, the Land Rover Heritage starting up. So they are going to produce parts for the for the heritage market uh, for the foreseeable future, which is nice. Well, why don't we move on in the news? Uh, speaking of defenders here in the United States, so we have, as uh, n- uh, my, our fellow American listeners know, we have uh, great desire for defenders. And uh, recently, as a result of that, at least I would think, uh, you know, our our uh, U.S. government seized a number of defenders, and there's uh, potentially a, there's a small update, and, and Harold's our man on the on this on the seizure case, so I'll let him do that. Well, it's it's actually been a rather busy month in that case. Uh, a number of of months ago, uh, Will Hedrick, a defender of the defenders, uh, attorney for virtually all the trucks that are involved in this, pro bono. Uh, he was doing the work pro bono. In fact, he has resigned his job with the state of North Carolina to pursue this and other causes, if you will, and and this is sort of his his banner case, if you will. That's that's a big big step, and kudos to Will and and his wife for making that decision that it was time to to step up. Uh, but uh, back to our story. A few months back, Will had filed a, a motion to dismiss on various merits, and uh, the government finally, dis- or the court, I should say, the court has finally denied that motion. Um, earlier in this month, I believe it was earlier in this month, Will filed a, a subpoena and uh, ordered the federal investigators to appear for deposition. That was uh, 
followed up by a filing by the federal government to suppress that motion and to protect the, the federal agents from being deposed as part of the discovery process. Uh, the, the judge has since decided this is getting annoying. He just <laughs> denied that motion and said, okay, you guys need to go to mediation and work this out, if at all possible. And the date for that mediation session was this past Friday. Uh, I've not heard what, what the result of that is. I think we'll be hearing very, very soon on that. But uh, uh, Will was cautiously optimistic as to that, but not expecting everything to be settled immediately. But progress is being made. and, and uh, Surprisingly quickly, too. Yeah. It, 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 well, it's fits and starts, as, as this stuff often goes. But I think the what's going to happen here is either something is going to be settled at this mediation or uh, it's not, and it's going to go back to court at that point. But I think, personally, uh, my, my opinion, my take on this is that the federal government is starting to see holes in their case and is backpedaling a little bit to protect themselves but uh, you know I'm sure that uh, we'll we'll know soon enough what's what's going to happen so good news yeah I, I, I take it news. as a positive sign something is at least happening yes well that's the news uh, kind of in a, more of a feature less than news is uh, something out of top gear in the Philippines there is uh, information about the Land Rover Ford Control 101 ambulance so there's a gentleman there who has found uh, an FC-101 ambulance in the UK. He bought it and is taking it back to the Philippines. They're going to restore it. And ultimately, the Land Rover Club of the Philippines uh, plans to uh, use it for relief and charity missions uh, with the truck. But uh, the thing, this interesting thing about the article is, I, I mean, I, Harold over the years has told me about the amb- uh, told me about the Ford Control, and I uh, has uh, indicated how many there were and how they were produced, and the ambulances were even more rare. But it's nice to see in print uh, details about that uh, Ford Control ambulance and Ford Controls in general. So they were only produced between 75 and 78 for the um, British military. And 2,669 units of, F- of SC-101s were actually produced. And they were primarily for the, uh, the British Army as a, an air transportable heavy-duty gun tractor. They were designed uh, to tow a field gun, the L-118 light gun, with uh, having a bunch of ammunition and other equipment in the rear load space. Uh, and then I think ambulances. Harold, do you remember the number? I'm sorry. I think it's four or 500, if four, I recall. Yes, you're right. 450 units of the SC were equipped as ambulances, and around half of those were built as left-hand drive for the British commitments to NATO in Europe. And they're a badass ambulance, that's for sure. That would be the... Be as the badass as the 101 FC is in general, the ambulance is just that much cooler, in my opinion. And there are some nice pictures on this article, which, of course, we will have on our show notes. But go check that out. Uh, really interesting. Uh, it's not a short and a long article, but you'll get to see the ambulance. You'll get to see more detail about uh, FC 101s. There are a couple here in North America. We've seen them. I know there's two in Canada. Uh, and there's a couple in the United States that we've seen. There's a couple uh, of soft tops, the GS uh, General Service, that uh, come to some of the different rallies. And I think there's a, a radio body somewhere on the continent that, mm-hmm. that gets out and does things. I don't know of any ambulance bodies. What engines do those have? Are they, those are all they all came with the 3.5 V8. Uh, gas. Petrol, Ga- petrol V8, yes. yes. Okay. The Rover V8. And what kind of mileage did do those get? If you have to ask, you can't afford, afford it. it. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, I don't think they're much worse than any disco out there. So. You know. Wow. That's you know, that's same. Ten, thing, huh? twelve, fifteen <laughs> downhill with a tailwind. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, so this is a good opportunity for you to use my 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 one and only Land Rover joke. The fastest way to slow down a Land Rover or a series truck. Drain the fuel. Take your foot off the accelerator. Boom, you could do the same thing with an FC. Just take your foot the accelerator. It'll come to stop. Okay, not a good joke, apparently. I, I, I'm I like that joke. I'm still working on it. Okay, I'll get there. The fastest way to slow down is take your foot off the accelerator. If you're going, you know, trying to stop the truck, just take your foot off the – it'll stop on its own because it's so – Okay. Uh, All right. That was our <laughs> – <laughs> that was our FC 101 <laughs> feature story. <laughs> and now, the Amore. I was poking around the internet a few weeks ago when I ran across an article written by master fabricator Jesse James. I believe it was intended as a personal reflection on a bad day in the shop, but I thought it was particularly inspirational. In his opinion, the hardest thing about being a craftsman isn't all the hard work or the years spent learning the skills. The hardest part is working all day long on something and then throwing it away when you realize it isn't right. 
Jesse then explains that how this loss is handled defines the difference between the average and the world-class professional. The average fabricator with pretty good skills will often try to save some of this wasted time and material by patching or polishing or covering up until it passes for acceptable work. If he doesn't have the confidence, he may try to hire someone else to fix his mistakes or just give up entirely. On the other hand, the world-class craftsman will carefully analyze where things went wrong, develop a plan of action, and do it right the next time. By doing so, the final product will be better, and the sense of pride and satisfaction will be much greater having overcome the adversity of failing and starting over. I can certainly relate to where Jesse is coming from. It's demoralizing to work long and hard at something and then realize I screwed something up. Furthermore, my parents, who grew up during the Great Depression, instilled in me an immense dislike for any sort of waste. As such, it is very difficult for me to throw something away and start over, even when it would make better sense to do so. I don't quit anything easily. Despite my best efforts to become world class, I suspect that much of the time I am at best what Jesse James would call pretty good. Clearly, this is something for me to work on. According to Thomas Edison, genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. He believed that success was a result of hard work and persistence. He said that opportunity is missed by most people because it is dressed in overalls and looks like work. Edison also believed that he got all the exercise he needed from working in his laboratory. I can personally relate to this. According to my fitness tracker, I routinely walk more than three miles a day without ever leaving my shop. Edison also had an interesting perspective on failure. He once said, if I find 10,000 ways something won't work, I haven't failed. I am not discouraged because every wrong attempt discarded is often a step forward. A prime example of this was the invention of the electric light bulb, which reportedly failed thousands of times before a practical, long-lasting example was found. Sir Frederick Henry Royce was once quoted as saying, strive for perfection in everything you do. Take the best that exists and make it better. When it does not exist, design it. This philosophy served him well, as the cars that bore his name quickly became known as the gold standard of automotive excellence. Gottlieb Daimler, sometimes called the father of the automobile, ran his company by the motto, the best or nothing at all. With ideals like these and over a century of experience, one would think that the automobile would actually be perfect by now, but sadly that's just not the case. It seems that the automotive industry lost its way somewhere in the middle of the 20th century. I have plenty of thoughts on how and why this happened, but that will be a discussion for another day. Suffice it to say that arrogant complacency and bean-counting administrators were involved, as it became more important to make money than to make better cars. However, there has been a bit of a renaissance in the automotive world in recent years, led by craftsmen like Jesse James, who still believe in the old world ideals of hard work and the relentless pursuit of excellence. For these mavericks, quality is more important than quantity. Doing it right is more important than doing it quickly or cheaply. What's my take on all this? Perfection is overrated, but excellence is underappreciated. There's a big difference between making something perfect and making something right. True perfection is unreachable, but it's easy to make something right with enough hard work and persistence. Just show up, do the best work you can, and never stop looking for ways to do it better. Like a lighthouse on a distant shore, perfection itself is not the ultimate destination, but if you keep an eye on it, it will lead you safely to the shores of excellence. Do not be afraid to occasionally change course in order to end up in the right place. Do not be afraid of failure. It's just part of the process. Do your best, and if it isn't right, then find a way to make it right. To quote the personal motto of Sir Frederick Henry Royce, whatever is rightly done, however humble, is noble. In other words, no matter how insignificant or trivial a job may seem, if it's worth doing, then it's worth doing right. This is the essence of excellence. Welcome back to the Sunday Steer Podcast. This is show number 26, and we will now have our heritage segment. We still don't have a name for it, but we're calling it the heritage segment, and we turn it over to our heritage segment correspondent from the great state of Vermont, Morgan. Thank you, and I, I actually like heritage segment. I think that works, so we'll just stick with that for now. I thought we'd already <laughs> settled on the heritage segment, which we have no name for. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, so this month we are continuing our sort of exploration of the technical details and options of the 
series Land Rover vehicles. Um, we started with uh, brakes and we went up to uh, other parts of the drivetrain, including diffs. And now we are pretty much up to uh, the gearboxes, transfer cases, and uh, uh, overdrives. Uh, so I just wanted to briefly walk through some of the history, and I am sure that Harold can correct me uh, as we go. Maybe. <laughs> um, so, the obviously, Land Rover started with the Land Rover, which we now know as the Series 1, um, and that was using a four-speed gearbox from the Rover P3. Um, so the Series 1 Land Rover was introduced in 1948, that gearbox has actually, or had actually been used by Land Rover since 1932. Um, and with that gearbox, they, uh, added a two speed transfer case, um, which offered semi permanent four wheel drive. Uh, it was an interesting setup. The transfer case, um, had, uh, it provided power to the front and rear axles, but the front was on a freewheel. Um, so that it basically would disengage on overrun. So if you were going uh, faster than the engine was providing power for, um, it would just not power those front wheels. Um, but you could actually uh, engage that um, into a, a full-time four-wheel drive. Like now, a diff lock, but not really. Right, Exactly. Um, and then in 1950, they switched over to using a transfer case that we now know with the, you know, the standard yellow knob where you either fully engaged or disengaged the front, uh, drive shaft. Um, and they basically used that setup continuing on through the series Land Rovers. Um, so yes, the series Land Rover gearbox it basically goes back to 1932 <laughs> um yep and they really didn't start to change much in there as far as i understand until the series 2a came out in 1961 um and even then only in the the later of those uh, series 2A gearboxes they, in the D suffix, they started adding in um, synchro to all the gears. Yeah, that uh, was very late in the run, but yeah, exactly. most of them were only synchronized on third and fourth. Exactly. But yeah, if you're working on a series 2 or 2A box, you really have to be mindful of your suffix numbers because all lots of little internal parts change with each suffix, and you have to keep track of which ones were which in your box. And especially these days, if you are working on a Series 2 uh, gearbox or 2A, uh, a lot of, you know, obviously those numbers, those suffixes were stamped on the boxes, uh, on the lids. Obviously, as things get changed around and upgraded and swapped, those lids often don't end up back where they should be. Yeah, you, or you mentioned the, or the, magic, the magic formula, and that is that the number is stamped on the lid, not on the case itself. So you have to watch what you're doing, definitely. Exactly. So, yeah, um, and in fact, the um, I think the ones with the uh, synchros had an S prefix on it. Uh, but again, just stamped on the lid. So you really have to disassemble it to ensure that it it is fully synchroed or not. <laughs> it doesn't take you long to find out, mind you. I've never seen one, True. but I don't think they're all that common. Certainly not on this side of the pond. No, definitely not. Um, and then, of course, uh, when they switched to the Land Rover Series 3 in 1971, then they all were synchro on all four gears fully synchro so um and interestingly they restarted the suffixes uh yes, on the series three they're all new again <laughs> um so when we say the d suffix on a series 2a that's different than a d suffix on a series three actually don't think they ever got to a d suffix on series three i could be wrong about that but. uh I, yeah i could have i could have uh made some mistakes in my notes i thought that the d suffix on the Series 3 was available in the UK, and that that's considered one of the the toughest of the 
Land Rover gearboxes. Yeah, I know the late Series 3s were, were excellent boxes. They fixed a lot of the, the shortcomings of the early uh, Series 3 boxes, which were considered weak. But I couldn't yep. remember which. You might be right. It might be a D-suffix. I can't remember. It's hard to keep up with all the little details like that without looking at the chart. Definitely. And obviously, it's only been relatively recently that we've been able to legally bring in those in terms of the full vehicles. So, uh, I have a late suffix series three box in the meat wagon, and it's an excellent box, I must say. You know, that being said, John had one and his it was not. It was, uh, well, you know, if it had been treated better, perhaps maybe at one point it was an excellent box because his being a 1980 would have been a great, you know, a late series box. But yeah, it was not treated well and was in very bad condition. Not, yeah, not by me. No, it came exactly. <laughs> well, and yours was a, a military vehicle, so. Correct. The 104th Royal Artillery based on a Stata Cart of Wales, British Territorials. Very nice. Um, so that pretty much covers. Oh, uh, there's actually one other. Um, the in terms of the series, the standard series vehicles, um, the two A and three uh, between 1968 and 1977, they actually offered a one ton of that of those models. Um, so basically just upgraded for carrying heavier loads. Um, that did actually include a lower ratio gearbox and transfer case. Uh, but otherwise... And a Salisbury front insane. axle, as I recall. Uh, yes, definitely. Um, and then they also had... The, the, the first really major changes didn't occur until the uh, Stage 1 V8, which, which pr- produced between 1979 and 1985. Uh, and that's when they s- first started switching to the Leyland transmission, so the like LT95 in that one, uh, which was actually also used in the FC101s. Um, and I think the Range Rover Classic um, through 1983. Yeah, it was uh, at and some the, point. I know that they were in the Range Classic. I don't know for what, what years. Yep. Yeah. And then I think also the first two years of the V8 Defenders, like 83 and 84. Um, and so that one is also still a, a four speed gearbox, um, but the gearbox and the transfer case are in a single enclosure. Um, and with that, they, they also switch to permanent four wheel drive, um, with a central locking diff. AKA all wheel drive. It, exactly. <laughs> um, and then 1984, they switched the Defenders over to the uh, LT230 um, transfer case, which was also permanent four-wheel drive with a central locking diff. Um, and for the gearbox, they used, well, throughout the years of the Defenders, they've used the LT77, the LT85, the R380, um, and pretty much all of those were mated with the LT230. Yeah, the LT230 was used in one form or another all the way up uh, until the end of the Disco 2. Very nice. And, and yeah, I'll let you in on, on a little, uh, little secret to decoding the, the, the LT numbers. LT stands for Leyland Transmission, and the, the number after that is the distance between the main shaft and the counter shaft in millimeters. Exactly. And the R380 is actually an updated version of the LT77S, which was an, uh, a slightly updated version of the original LT77. And the R380 stands for rated to 380 newton meters of input. Nice. I didn't actually catch that. And uh, so in terms of possible upgrades... Uh, two series Land Rovers. Obviously, since the Defender did use the LT230 and the other, you know, LT77, LT85, and R380 gearboxes, you can actually put those in. You need to make, obviously, some modifications to uh, cross members and your firewall and your transmission tunnel, uh, but you can put those in in a series Land Rover. Um, to get a five-speed with uh, permanent four-wheel drive. Yeah, uh, you can. It's not yeah, you pretty. can. 
It is it is not pretty. You normally uh, have to move the engine forward, otherwise you end up with the shifter in between the seats. Right. Yes. Uh, again, these are these are big big modifications. Uh, there are lots more modifications out there. Um, the other problem is that the front axle, uh, the U joints in the front axle, don't care for the full time four wheel drive. That is a good point for sure. So there's a couple ways around that. One is uh, actually, if you go to Ashcroft, they have a couple of workarounds. They have um, they have a way to convert the LT230 from full time to part time four wheel drive. It basically replaces the the center diff with a with a, a sliding dog clutch, um, if you will. Uh, the other option is to uh, use an adapter they make that adapts the um, series transfer case to the five-speed transmission and you and you run the five-speed transmission but you run the original series transfer case which believe it or not is actually a more robust transfer case than the lt230 yep definitely those are very good very, very good options um and i don't know if we will probably include in the show notes the links to those uh ashcroft um adapters and options um and obviously you have some other options in terms of sticking with the stock gearbox and transfer case. Um, Ashcroft offers high ratio transfer cases, or you can just get, you know, you can swap out the whole transfer case, or you can just get the gear set. Yeah, the problem uh, with the high ratio transfer case is that, um, you know, gear ratio wise, it's a lot like starting out in second gear. You lose your first gear. Which I mean is not a big deal if you've got enough horsepower, but if you're still running the stock two and a quarter petrol on in a 109 or a heavy heavy rover, it's it's an interesting thing to get started sometimes. For sure. <laughs> in an 88, uh, it's just not an issue. You can start in second gear without any problem. Yep, and I I'm spoiled. I have an 88, so <laughs> um, you also can do a a fair number of overdrive options. Um, the ferry overdrives were very common. Uh, they uh, they can be a bit of a, a weak link. They share oil from the uh, the gearbox. No, they do not. Or sorry, the transfer case. No, they do not. Oh, they don't. The ferry right. has its own own right. uh, the, separate oil supply. Right. But, but the weak link in the ferry is the bearings they use. They the, there's just not a lot of, of real estate in the case to fit good bearings in there and there's a lot of side load because of the way that the gears are arranged the spur gear arrangement puts a lot of side load on the counter shaft and it puts a lot of end thrust and they use these very delicate little needle bearings in there that just don't hold up with uh well if you try to use them in low gears you're putting a lot of torque through the box and and if you have a high output engine you're putting a lot of excess torque through the overdrive that was never intended so you know, if guys are doing engine upgrades, I don't recommend using the ferry for that reason. It's, it's, uh, you know, if you're, if you're running a two and a quarter petrol or even the 200 DI, which isn't that much more power output than than the stock engine, and you're nice to the ferry, it'll be okay. But your strongest gear ratios to run the overdrive are going to be fourth gear and and maybe third if you're careful. But I wouldn't, yeah, you, I wouldn't use it in first and second like a lot of guys do off the road. That's a recipe for destroying your overdrive quickly. Oh yeah, definitely for. Pretty much most of the overdrives, it's definitely preferable to use it as the overdrive, you know, above your fourth gear or a stepper between third and fourth. Yeah, I like third gear over. It's a real nice gear ratio for climbing hills. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, you can find the uh, the ferry overdrives on, on Craigslist and eBay. Um, but, you know, regarding the bearings, usually you can you can hear them. They're I, well, you can always hear them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they are yeah, loud. They anyway. let you know they're there. <laughs> yes. But they really, they really let you know when they're not happy. I'll, I'll tell you that. Exactly. Um, so you know, be careful picking up one of those because uh, most likely it needs to be rebuilt before being used. Um, I'm actually a little unsure on on what the parts status is uh, because the company in the U.S. that had purchased the rights for ferry overdrives and was making parts um which was uh, RDS. rds um has actually recently closed down really I mean, yes I hadn't heard. 
Yeah, George uh, shut down for health reasons. Well, he was a it was a one man show down there, so I'm not totally surprised. But he he uh, stopped production of the he was actually making uh, reproduction ferry overdrives for a while, and he stopped doing that. But I know yep. he had a, a fairly good selection of parts, and and maybe somehow those parts will still be available through some other channel. Yeah, I heard a rumor that somebody else had. Uh, you know, picked up his assets, uh, but I'm not, I hadn't confirmed that yet, and I'm not sure whether, you know, any other rights were transferred or will be taken advantage of, so. Well, if even the parts inventory was available, that'd be a, a boon. Exactly. So I, I'd imagine that the parts inventory is going to show up somewhere, just don't know where or when. <laughs> um, and then there are a few other overdrive options. Uh, there's the Toro overdrive, which is uh, beefier than the ferry. Um, there's also the Santana overdrive, um, which obviously that has been discontinued. Uh, but there's uh, Hasty out of the Netherlands um, produces a clone of that called the Superdrive. That one is is significantly stronger than the ferry as well. Um, and then here in North America, there's the Romer Drive. Uh, they initially produced an SX model. Now that it, they've done a second generation called the SS. Um, so that one, that's actually the one that shares the oil between the the uh, gearbox and the um, the itself. Uh, so that, that makes, you know, maintaining oil a little easier. I believe that the ferries, it was possible for the transfer case to uh, to leak oil into the ferry. Yeah. If I'm, I believe, yeah, it was possible. I, I, there was I, a seal there, but I, I don't know how effective it was. But yeah, uh, yeah, the the, uh, the Romer Drive, which used to be known as Rover Drive before everyone got through the the naming wars. Exactly. <laughs> uh, they do share oil with the transfer case, and they uh, the the nice thing about the kit is it comes with a, a nifty little uh, uh, fill plug that that gets moved, and a dipstick that goes in place of the old fill plug on the transfer case. So now you can check your transfer case oil level from between the seats. You pull out the little cover, and you look down, and you can pull the dipstick, and and it's uh, it's pretty cool. Uh, they also make a really nice. Uh, finned aluminum uh, sump cover, which replaces the stamped steel unit that that always leaks. And I believe that the stamped steel one always leaks because of the uh, the temperature issues in the series. <laughs> uh, well, the steel expands train. at a different rate from the aluminum, so, so exactly. there's a lot of dimensional changes which make it difficult for a gasket to seal. But you know, th there's also the stiffness issue. They're just it's hard to keep them totally flat because they are sheet metal. Yep, exactly. So yeah, that's that cover is a very nice option. And, and the nice thing about the fins is it helps to control the heat of the fluid in the in the transfer case and the overdrive since there's additional load on that on that oil. Exactly. And that one's actually, you know, compared to the other overdrives, it's a much more modern overdrive as well. Um, highly engineered. So that was a pretty nice option. It's a, it's a very well engineered unit. Uh, in fact, I've got one sitting on my shop floor right now waiting to go into the meat wagon and I'll have more info as to its performance uh, soon, hopefully. Excellent. That's awesome. Yeah, I've actually pondered becoming a distributor for them, but you know, we'll see. First things first. Exactly. <laughs> I Should think that's fun, really yeah. the next good option for overdrives, and I really am not. I'm sort of shying away from recommending ferries unless somebody's got a good deal on one or, or whatever, and they're going into a, a light vehicle with without added power. But I think if you're going to the, the added horsepower, you want to be with the Romer drives. I think that's the one that can take it better than anything else. I agree. Yeah, from what I've read, that one definitely seems the best at this point. Uh, you know, I think the Santana and the Hasty, the Superdrive, is a, a close second, but it's it's still a fairly old design. Yeah, they're not bad, but but they're not as good. Number one, and they're also really hard to find. Yes, definitely. And you know, when you are going to pay the price that you would for like the Hasty Superdrive, it's pretty much the same price as the the Romer Drive. So. At least here in the U.S., um, I would go with the Romer Drive for sure. I'd be inclined to agree. It makes more sense, and I think parts availability, if you do have a problem, is better. 
the factory yep. support, you know, all those sort of things. And I think that covers pretty much all of the overdrives. There may be one or two other options out there that were Europe only that I'm just not remembering. Um, but that's pretty much all of the overdrive options. Um, obviously, if you, you know, you can go from standard, use the overdrives. Those are, are great options. Uh, you can, uh, do the Ashcroft transfer case modifications. Um, you can also, um, there, there is a replacement transfer case, um, made here in the U S by the same company that does the, uh, disc brake conversions, uh, four bind brothers. Obviously that's, those are really designed for, uh, you know, if you're using a completely different engine setup, uh, we'll get into that later. <laughs> that's a, a a huge discussion. Well, if you're, um, if you're going that way, if you're going to go with a different engine and transmission, uh, you know, there's another option, too, that you can, if you want to go with, say, like an American truck transmission, Advanced Adapters makes a number of, of adapter packages that will allow you to, to bolt the the Land Rover transfer case, to, uh, the series truck transfer case, to the back of of pretty much any transmission you want. Exactly, and that that is the other option I was going to mention. That that you know, as you said, the series transfer case is actually a very strong transfer case. It's uh, one of the toughest cases you can buy. Actually, it's one of the one of the most robust transfer cases on the planet. If you can get past the arcane shifting of it, <laughs> right. And the collective slop in it. It's not. It's not tightly tolerance. It's not a quiet box. It's not a smooth box. But they're they're virtually bulletproof. For sure. So there are there's a lot of a lot of options there. <laughs> if you're if you're going to change your engine, I believe that one of the differences with the uh, the Forbine Brothers transfer case is it is um, a very short transfer case um, okay. so that it can accommodate some of the the longer automatic gearboxes um, there are a lot of you know domestic Ford international harvest GM Dodge all those truck gearboxes you can get uh, short four speed top loading gearboxes that you can you can put in front of the uh, you know the series transfer case pretty easily with one of those uh, those adapters. Right. Uh, but once you get into some of the longer ones, not only do you need to move the engine forward, um, but, you know. Yeah, the fabrication you, starts to get involved. Exactly. Say, say the you, least. You start to, you know, really change prop shaft lengths and angles and all of that stuff. So I, I wonder. If, <laughs> big if, proviso uh, there. <laughs> I wonder That's if the length difference is enough to allow you to put uh, the Rover 5-speed transmission in front of that and still have it end up in the right place that you know that's a good question um i didn't see mention of that for their uses because it's really only about four inches different as i recall yeah that's a good possibility if if you go to like the uh well the lt77 isn't bad Uh, and the hot ticket now i think if you really want to go all land rover and and uh have it be robust uh you you got to buy all the parts out of ashcroft but they have what they call the stumpy r380 uh, if you've ever seen an R380, it has a very long input shaft and a, and a long bell housing, but they make a, a short bell housing version that's that's much it's, – it's it's very squat like the LT77, but it has the R380 internals in it. Nice. And, and the same uh, bolt pattern as the LT77, will, which will actually bolt – uh, eh, it takes a little bit of modification to put it on the back of, of a series. You've got to move a couple studs. It's a lot like adapting the series transmission to fit the back of a, of a TDI, which is the LT77 pattern. It's doable. It's very close. You just have to move a couple studs, and, and which isn't a big deal. It's half an hour of machining time. Yep. Now, um, let's see. Uh, ECR used to do a fair number of coilover conversions, uh, for series vehicles, and I think they were always putting the R380 in theirs. I don't remember exactly what else they were doing. Obviously, it was a coil- coilover conversion anyway. Right. And they're really not doing series <laughs> anymore, so it's kind of hard to get any info out of them as far as that. Yeah, I uh, I did look at one uh, that was being auctioned off at last year's uh, Vermont Rover. What was it? Vermont Rover. The Overland Rover. 
Yes, the over the Roverland rally. That's what it was. <laughs> they have so many uh, different names there for stuff in Vermont. I don't know how you keep up. Uh, it's difficult. <laughs> uh, but yeah, they there was a a nice specimen there that was running the R380. Uh, but yeah, I should have taken a closer look to see how they were doing that setup. I, I think they'd have to be doing this the the stumpy box, but I, I could be wrong. Yeah. I think it's it'd be very a challenge likely. to make it all fit if you don't. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, <laughs> lots of lots of options there. Um anytime you start going beyond the uh the the series the stock series equipment, um you start playing with a lot of changes. Um so you really want to plan way ahead if you can on all of that. Right, and you can uh, know your parts too. For sure. Uh, but, you know, as we've discussed, the, the overdrives, the really nice thing about the, uh, the series Land Rover, uh, drivetrain is that, you know, they were designed for a front and rear power takeoff unit. Um, so those overdrives just plug right into the, the rear PTO ports. So. Right, and it doesn't take you too long to uh, remove it and and put it back to stock, uh, which if you have a ferry, you need to know how to do because there's a good chance it may break on the trail. Well, and I was actually going to say that uh, if you have a ferry, keep the uh, the PTO yep, standard cover trail with you. recovery kit. Yeah, <laughs> you always keep that that gear and that that uh, a spare nut in the lock tab with you. Exactly. Uh, I have definitely seen over the years a couple of of posts on Craigslist from people saying that they had a ferry and they were on a long trip and it broke and they just needed <laughs> those parts. Yeah. You see that on the forum a lot. Help. I need the rescue kit. <laughs> exactly. So yeah. And well you need the going. wrench too, the, the special spanner to undo the main shaft nut. Yep. So it makes a nice little kit for your, you know, for your off-road bag. Definitely. Um, so I think that covers pretty much all of the upgrades for the series uh, drivetrain in, in terms of gearboxes, transfer cases, and overdrives. Uh, if you want to see a lot of the options out there, especially a lot of the domestic gearbox options, um, as usual, I highly suggest Terry Ann Wakeman's uh, expeditionlandrover.info website. She has a lot of documentation including specs and photos from people who have done a lot of these uh, upgrades and conversions. Not to uh, mention she's got a lot of the gear ratios listed and a lot of the uh, the things to consider uh, when you're making a change like that, a lot of the things to think about that you don't often think about until you've done it before, and so she's done that work for you. Exactly, and she has really done the work for us. She is running a, a completely different setup in her dormobile. It's pretty nice. Yeah, it is nice. It's uh, I think back in the day that was the setup because maybe some of these more interesting Land Rover parts weren't available. But uh, I like I'm a fan of the all Land Rover conversions if possible. But I'm I'm that way. But uh, she's she's uh, running the 302 Ford and I I, I think it's uh, a new process transmission she's running. I know it's an American truck transmission of some sort. Oh yeah. Uh... And an Ashcroft high ratio transfer case in it, and it works well for her for what she's doing. Yep, definitely. But she covers a lot of the other options too, and and uh, she also covers a lot of the uh, you know gear ratios in the various Land Rover parts because they weren't all the same. Some of the internal ratios are different in the different gearboxes, and uh, of course, uh, make mention of the, the LT230 that we talked about. Uh, they were not all the same. Uh, there were several different flavors of the LT230, uh, one of the big differences being the ratio of the high range. It was quite different depending on which engine you had. If you had the four-cylinder, uh, the 2.5 petrol in the early Defenders or the, or the uh, uh, 2.5 uh, NA diesel, you ran a, a relatively high numeric, uh, low-geared uh, uh, high range, but if you have a, a 300 TDI, you don't need that. And if you had the V8, you had an even even lower number. So you, so you want to make sure you know what you have because if you uh, you know upgrade your engine in a transfer case, it's running a 1.67. You're going to be revving like crazy and not going anywhere. But on the other hand, if you have a 1.2, uh, 
uh, gear in something running a, a, a lower powered engine, you're just you're going to have a hard time getting going. Exactly. She's got a lot of a lot of that documentation there, so you can go through your system and really figure out what you have and what you want. And the nice thing to know is you know where to look for the parts you do want. If you if you see the number you like, you look at where it is and go get it. Exactly. And that's that you know, it's an excellent resource for that, especially I, I'm with you. I prefer to try to stick with all Land Rover if possible. Uh especially, you know, now it's a little more reasonable to get Land Rover all Land Rover parts. So you know, it's it's kinda interesting to try to stick to that route. I, I I like to think that I'm doing it the way that that uh, Land Rover Special Vehicles would be doing it if they were asked to do it. And really, let's face it, it's basically how Land Rover has done it all along. Right. <laughs> you go to the parts bin. What do we got? I like that mentality. For sure. So yeah, I think that covers it. For now. For now, for sure. So that is our heritage segment for the month of May, the 26th episode of the Sinister Podcast. We should also add uh, that, uh, Morgan, you run the SeriesParts.com site. Can you tell us a little more about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it's it's basically uh, it's somewhat of a portal website. Uh, so it's, it's basically uh, set up to help you find parts. Um, I list a lot of parts suppliers, and um, you can also search uh, current Craigslist and eBay parts. Um, all the series parts that are listed on both of those sites. Um, I also list uh, garages and restoration shops. So if you're looking somewhere locally, um, both for parts and for service, you can find those. I do list series friendly events on the events calendar um, and, you know, always working on, on new features. So you can reach out to me there or on, on Twitter at series parts and I'll help you look for what you're, looking for <laughs> and you're you're also on facebook at series parts that's true although morgan personally is not on to, on facebook but it's, it, it's true i stick to the <laughs> business page that's it <laughs> well and i thank you very much for doing all the research and putting all this information together for the heritage segment it's very much appreciated absolutely i have to admit i uh i like geeking out on this stuff so it's a lot of fun to fill in my gaps it's wonderful. Well, good. It's what I live for, so I'm good with that. There you go. <laughs> excellent, excellent. So that uh, is going to bring us to a close, another episode of the Center Steer Podcast. Uh, before we kind of finally close it out, I would like to thank all of our Twitter and Facebook followers. Uh, I haven't gone out and personally thanked everyone, but uh, wanted to say we're very much appreciative of you follow us and contribute as you do. Uh, one in particular I'd like to call out, uh, We there's a, a gentleman who uh, is his Twitter account is p 40 Wolf. Morgan the Wolf is, is his name. Apparently he's an overlanding explorer and archaeologist out searching about for things long missing. And I guess he's in Arizona at the moment. So about 15 days ago, he uh, tweeted at us and had found a U.S. Cavalry bridle bit on survey. Uh, it's a pre-1905, probably a witness to the Apache Indian War. I realize this has nothing to do with Land Rovers or anything, but I just thought it was really cool. And uh, that's one of our listeners out there, so we want to say... Uh, well, shout out to Morgan the Wolf. Well, he's he's found uh, you know parts from from the uh, original expedition vehicle on this continent. <laughs> That's right, from pre <laughs> days. <laughs> exactly. We like our history, our heritage here. We do, we do. And and actually, I'd like to open it up to any of our our listeners. If you would like to join us in the podcast, uh, get at this, and uh, we'll see about getting you on the podcast. Maybe you want to join the panel give your insight, or if you would like to, uh, maybe we'll talk about you and your truck or what you're doing with your truck. Uh, maybe we'll have a little, maybe just spend a little five minutes talking about it. We'd certainly be happy to do that. And I think that's uh, kind of, a, we're reached a level, I think, where we can do that. Or, or even about. if you have a suggestion for things that, that you'd like to hear us cover, I think that would be, be good to hear from you. Absolutely. Yeah, that'd be good. Uh, if you started a Morgan drinking game for every time he says exactly, uh, let us know about that too. 
If you still yeah. have a pulse. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm curious how far you make it through the show, if at all. <laughs> exactly. All right, so that is the end of the 26th edition of the Center Steer Podcast officially. Uh, as we've now joined the 4x4 radio network, uh, we'll be available through the network. That doesn't mean we're leaving centersteer.com or we're not leaving Facebook or Twitter. We're just being added on to the uh, 4x4 radio network. So we're joining there. So we're happy to be part of the network and join the family of podcasts talking about four by fours, overlanding, adventure, whatever it is we do uh, that we like to talk about heritage, I guess, sometimes, too. So I want to thank uh, Harold for joining us, uh, Morgan uh, from Vermont and Matt from the United Kingdom, adding to the discussion. Really appreciate it. That'll be it. And we will talk to you next month in June for the 27th edition of the Semester Podcast. Thanks very much, everybody. Have a great month. The Center Steer theme song, Sunset Rider by the Tritons, is available from Nibio's Music Alley. Check it out at music.nibio.com. Three amigos. <laughs>